We need a government that reassures the international markets. We need policies that will bring economic recovery. And we need a government that understands that great change is needed in order to restore faith in our political system. Britain voted for change yesterday, but it also voted for a new politics. It did not vote for party political bickering, grandstanding and point scoring. Our country's problems are too serious. They are too urgent for that. So we must all rise to this occasion. We must show leadership. We must sort things out as quickly as possible for the good of the country. Since coming to power in 2010, the coalition government have introduced sweeping welfare reforms. Every aspect of the state benefit system has been affected. The unemployed, disabled, pensioners, and people on low incomes have seen radical changes which reduce their quality of life. In part 1, we look at these reforms and the effects these changes have had on poor and vulnerable people. who said on Tuesday that the government was playing with fire by squeezing budgets in a flat economy. Hugh Pym reports. The growth numbers are certainly not uh, particularly good. Uh, and his uh, extreme austerity, the path of precipitous cuts and tax rises, are actually choking off uh, the recovery and the growth that we need to repair the public finances. <laughs> protect the interest of the rich and they build up fear in the people who aren't rich. Um, I've been on benefits, uh, I've just only just found a job, I've been on benefits for something like six months and it's been really horrible. We want our children to have good education and good health care. This is what my grandmother, who was a suffragette, actually fought for. And my father spent six years in North Africa fighting for a decent country and this government is uh, going to destroy it. We are in a depression, so says my guest today. Unemployment at levels last seen during the 30s, an economic crisis in the Eurozone, and the prospect of worse to come. There are, really, there are fundamental structural or political reasons. The Europeans have this common currency that doesn't work. The United States has one of our two major political parties, a stark raving mad. Britain stands out in the nature, in the fact that its error is unforced. This government does not have to be doing this. It is choosing, out of a misunderstanding of the situation, to, to do a destructive economic policy. Educated people working in the National Health Service are saving lives every single day. Away from them, and worst of all, now, as we speak, fairness and respect and dignity in our society still to decide. We have to decide whether or not we're prepared to put up with this. Cavalry waiting to come to our rescue, riding over a hill. There's no knighting these things. We have to stand up and fight for these things now. There's nobody else left. <laughs> NUJ members and Beck2 members across the BBC are on strike today because of the problems that they're facing with compulsory redundancies, endemic bullying across the corporation and unmanageable work. Ah, that's it, that's it. The spare room benefit cut, why thousands of tenants may have to downsize or pay extra to stay put. Well, the new rules allow one bedroom for each adult or couple, but two children under 10 will be expected to share a room, and if they're of the same sex, they'll have to share until they're 16. One spare room will mean a 14% cut in housing benefit. Two spare rooms will incur a 25% reduction. I've downsized already from a four bedroom to a two bedroom and I'm only keeping that other room because my son who, who's in the armed forces needs that when he comes home on leave. Opposition is growing. For the first time, leading doctors have entered the debate. John Gibbs is a consultant paediatrician and speaks on behalf of the UK's foremost child disability experts. To impose this tax, or this so-called bedroom tax, on families because they have a disabled child is astounding and it's appalling. The policy says that children with disabilities must share a room 
Can you see any sense in that? No, no. Because um, of all their medical needs that the severely disabled children have, um, that's why that we as paediatricians and the therapists provide reports and help them to get specially adapted bedrooms. Um, and to then say you have to share your bedroom with your brother or sister, that takes away most of the benefit of having your own adapted bedroom. It makes it more difficult for the parents or other carers to look after that disabled child at night. And it's highly disruptive to the brother and sister that has to share that bedroom. It's going to break up families and break up communities. I think it's disgusting. I, th I think it's just part of the uh, Tory government dismantling the welfare state. It's a tax on poor people. The whole system is not is skewed towards the wealthy. Feel the hole that was made by giving a trillion pounds of our money to bankers. The poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer. It's very, very clear that there's a dividing line between the rich and the poor. We've definitely got a corrupt system. The poor are being asked to subsidise and pay for the mistakes and the flagrant uh, uh, theft of the nation's assets by these bankers, aided and abetted uh, by these Tory uh, cabinet of millionaires. So we're out here today to say, no, we're not having it. Right, the rich caused this economic crisis, and yet poor people are on housing estates, working poor, the unemployed are being forced to uh, pay the price. Nearly 60 years I've been in that house, all my memories there. My mum and dad, that my mum and dad died in that house. I've been brought up there for about 10 months. We saw them going to fight it all the way. And if a bailiff's come in my door, I board that up. Here's a government which didn't actually win the last election, let's not forget, full of some of the richest people in society, imposing cuts on people who had nothing to do with this crisis. And we're here to say enough is enough. The Conservatives didn't even win the last election. They only got 36% of the vote, despite being up against the Labour Party, a bit less popular than cholera. Uh, one message to the government, um, enough is enough. We're going to take you on and you're going to lose. My suspicion is that people will not uh, save the government money because a lot of people will move out of subsidised accommodation, social housing if you like, into the private rented sector. They'll move into smaller homes but actually the rents will be higher so the cost of the government through benefits will be higher. David has leukaemia and doesn't expect to recover. He lives alone in this two bed in Wigan, his family home for 40 years. When you've grown up in a place and you know your parents both lived here and basically died here. You like to think that the way I am at the minute, I would have the opportunity to actually end my days here as well. And if you were to do what the government wants you to do, it would actually cost them more money. Yeah, I thought, I, I th I thought it would. You know, because I've looked at the rents and it's actually more than this house. What do you make of that? I think that's just stupid. Millions of the poorest households in England could face council tax rises of up to £200 a year. When you're told that one bit of money that you're given is because you need it, you know? I'm not, a, I'm not a stranger. This is a tax increase imposed on people who are poor, they don't have a lot of money, carers, the disabled, single mums, people who work, and it's going to come in in the same month that millionaires are going to get a tax cut. It's not fair. Meet Wendy Morrison. She's a single mum living in the Aspley area of Nottingham. She struggles to make ends meet and it's about to get tougher. My council tax is £45 a month and I think they're looking for another 20% to go on top of that, which is virtually impossible to find. How do you feel about that? Disgusted. I genuinely think it's going to have a very devastating impact on the poorest people in our city. We've already seen a sharp increase in, in, in poverty levels and receipt of food parcels, particularly across the East Midlands, and I think this is only going to exacerbate the situation. The families we're talking about who are on very low incomes have faced stagnant wages over the last decade, rising costs of living, and they're now facing ongoing cuts to tax credits and other support. So I think to ask them to pay what in some cases are soaring increases in their council tax at this point in time um, doesn't strike me as particularly realistic.
Here, 300,000 more people are likely to have been pushed into fuel poverty this Christmas, according to government advisers. A household is considered fuel poor if more than 10% of income is spent on gas and electricity. That's a monthly £200 for families with a take-home pay of £2,000. There's a terrible irony in the fact that people who used to dig coal out of the ground to make a living now barely have enough money to keep warm themselves. But it's not just here. Fuel poverty now is becoming a genuinely serious problem for millions of people all over Britain. Since 2005, in this country, wages have gone down in real terms. Yet during the same period, fuel prices have doubled. And everywhere, it's the poorest who are the hardest hit. To add insult to injury, the national body which tries to help people with these problems has just had its funding cut by the government. I reckon there's about 350,000 households in, in Wales currently. Uh, classes being in fuel poverty, fuel bills are up 33% on where they were. It's, it's a huge problem. If I have the heat on, how long can I get on for? I can't afford to put my money in the meter, so I have to ration it, like people did in the war. You had rations, that's what you do today. You ration yourself, you ration yourself with the cheap food you buy. You even have to ration that. Get your heart in your mouth when you get one of these things. You just wondered how much you've used. It's very hard to work out. I had a duvet cover, I've got a sheet, and I put this coat on. And anything else available, I put on to keep as warm as I can. I have to uh, economise somewhere. So, we're, you know, if the bills just come, I will reduce the amount of food that comes into the house. The gas meter. You're constantly thinking about it all the time. How can I get more out of it? How can I make it last longer? Um, <clears throat> switch it all off and go to the library for four or five hours or go out somewhere for four or five hours. I would like to ask EDF why they keep hiking the bill, actually. It seems to be this kind of attitude that, oh, well, if, you know, 30 people die a year of, you know, fuel poverty, it's all right. It's like just another statistic. I mean, Jesus. It's not 30, it's 8,000. 8,000 people a year. Households are currently deemed to be in poverty if the money coming in is below 60% of the average income. But a new report from the think tank Policy Exchange says that definition is too narrow and that social deprivation should also be considered. Usually a little bit more than this, but at the moment I've got one egg, some milk, some cheese and some butter. And, and, some and it's like this often? Often, yeah, very often. Nice. In Britain, around 13 million people are living in relative income poverty. Many now fear that as the UK government looks to cap annual increases in some benefits to people out of work, far more will find themselves in financial trouble. At this homeless shelter in Leeds, rooms normally used for classes have become makeshift dormitories. Bev used to sleep here, but now works as a volunteer. But it's hard for people that have ended up with nothing on the streets and trying to start again. They haven't got the money to go and buy a, a decent pair of trousers or a decent pair of shoes to go to an interview. Sometimes by the time you finish paying your bills, you might only have like £20 left to buy for food to last you two weeks. And we are giving away over half a tonne of food away every week at the moment, just here in Norwood. Um, over Christmas, we gave away three tonnes in three days. Some people would actually say that they, they, they don't believe that that's happening in this modern day society in this country. In this city, we know that 20% of the population, that's about 59,000, are living on the breadline. That is, after paying for fuel, paying for food and everything else, they have nothing left. And that is an amazing statistic. I have gone without food, um, and I know there's times where I have, you know, struggled, where I've been like, gosh, you know, there's no food there and I've got no money. The children see that their parents are stressed and worrying about money. Children are aware of their parents going without. Nearly half the children from the poorest families in our survey said that they saw their parents going without things like food or clothes themselves just to make ends meet. The sad case is that this, this, there's not just one Alicia. Um, there are hundreds and thousands of people living that sort of existence because um, that's what it is in existence. There's no purpose or meaning to it, it's, it's an existence. Um, just going from day to day, hand to mouth, um, wondering where the next meal is going to come from.
I don't know what the answer is, but I do believe it's going to take a lot more ordinary people doing what I'm doing to step into that gap for the meantime. We've just got to do what we can. Um, there has to be hope. There has to be hope. Without hope, we're finished. He's come up with this idea of replacing all the benefits now with a single universal credit, it will be called, which you would keep some of it if you went into work. And the idea is that get everybody into work, make work pay. Now, the problem with that is if you look at the main benefits, uh, income support, uh, incapacity benefit, uh, employment and maintenance allowance, and the job seekers allowance, which is a princely 65, 45 a week, I'd like to say anybody survive on that. If you take all those, there's five million people on them. Now, it's all very well saying go and get a job. The government's own figures show in the economy there are fewer than half a million vacancies. So you have 10 people on those benefits for every single vacancy. So I just can't see how you can make those sums work. The great suspicion is that Conservatives are up to their old tricks of scapegoating, scapegoating the poor and blaming the unemployed for their joblessness. If it were just simply a simplification of the benefits system and bringing all the benefits under one umbrella, we would be the first to support that. But we don't think that is what it's really about. We think it's a real demonisation of people who rely, have, rely on benefits, the working class, the people that most need our services. And we, we already the indications are that, that it will make things much, much more difficult for people trying to survive on a very low well, income. We're both unemployed parents and we'll only get 100, about £110 a week. If, when they've taken off the bedroom tax, then they've taken off the council tax we're now el eligible for and the water rates we're also eligible for out of that money. That is going to leave us very, very short. What this government is doing is so awful that I have to take every opportunity to stand up against what they're doing and, and show whether it will do any good or not. I've, I've come to hundreds of demos here and I'm not here because necessarily I think it will do any good. I'm here for me because when in years to come when somebody says what did you do, I'll say well I did what I could. Um, we're here protesting today against companies that are using uh, unpaid slave labour in their shops. Uh, basically, we think that if, uh, if you're doing a, a day's work, then you should get a day's pay for that work. And to pay someone uh, their dole money for doing that work is essentially slave labour. Last week, it was Tesco at the forefront of the row over the government's work programme. Now, Channel 4 News can reveal that the supermarket giant Asda has also been taking on unemployed youngsters for free. This programme has learnt that an Asda store in Harrogate took on 12 jobless youngsters over the Christmas rush, while other staff complained their hours had been cut. The company refuses to say how many people it took on nationwide and how many got jobs. And it was clear in the official letter, he says, that it wasn't voluntary. If he didn't attend, he could lose his benefits. What did other people who work at ASDA say about you? How, how were they about you working there? Uh, not too pleased. At night, you know, when it was quiet, there's no one around to hear it. You know, be like, this is rubbish. <laughs> you know, there's no overtime and you're doing our work for us. Joseph wasn't offered a job, but he was given a reference. During this time, she proved herself slash himself to be punctual and hardworking. She, he was a team player, using his, her own initiative. It is not, you know, it had taken them two minutes, and they couldn't be bothered to do that. There's no clear evidence that it's particularly successful at getting people to go into work. It takes them away from searching for jobs, and often the work they do isn't related to the kind of jobs they might ultimately get. Oh, 
angry campaigners march and chant down London's busiest shopping street to protest against the government's welfare-to-work schemes. The boycott workfare campaigners surrounded well-known high street stores demanding an end to unpaid work placements with welfare sanctions. I just think it's really wrong that people that are the poorest in society are being forced to work for nothing by big corporations, which is what workfare is about, and it's lots of different kinds of schemes that the government is bringing in. And also, I just feel so angry that one of the main providers of workfare, A for E, um, they, you know, people have lost jobs because of them. Um, I know people that have had these fake mass interviews which don't lead to a job and have actually lost part-time jobs. I know people um, who are homeless who've gone back on the streets because they're so threatened by this. The reason I know um, these people is because I work with volunteers and I just think it's really, really wrong to make people work for nothing. I feel that the government doesn't listen to the people, what, you know, whatever, and I think that this is the only way. Well, we're hoping to scrap that we can encourage Primark, etc., to scrap this workfare programme, which is obviously, to any thinking person, ridiculous. You cannot have young people working 30 hours a week for no pay. We want the government to scrap the workfare scheme altogether. They say they have made concessions when they actually haven't made any concessions at all. I mean, the voluntary work experience scheme was meant to be voluntary in the first place, so how is it a concession that it's now voluntary? I say that's deception. And then George Osborne has been quoted as saying that if you do not agree to the voluntary work experience scheme, you will be suggested for the mandatory work experience scheme, which is in effect the same issue that we were protesting against last week, that this is in fact not voluntary, it's mandatory. It is young people being forced to work for nothing and we want the scheme.